racing cars today are highly complex machines. The technicians on each team have to be able to diagnose a problem almost instantaneously. How well the crew knows the car's system often means a difference between winning and losing. Hi, I'm Howdy Holmes. On the track, if I want a competitive ride, I have to rely on my pit crew. And I do, because they're professionals. Now with my family car, I rely on the Buick technicians. They have to keep up with all the new complex components and systems in today's new cars. One example of a complex system is the Turbo Hydromatic 440 T4. I know that's its name because I learned all about it last week. It's a four-speed, automatic, overdrive, transaxle, the latest in transmission technology. It looks complicated if you're not familiar with it. Well, anyway, a while ago, I noticed some shifting problems with my LeSabre. So I brought it down here to get it fixed. That's where I learned about the 440T4 from Jim. He's the transaxle expert. In fact, I learned so much, I wanted to share my experience with you. Okay, howdy, that's fine. You shut it off. So, tell me about this problem. Jim, sometimes I get this harsh, low to second shift. I've done some preliminary checks. I can't seem to figure it out. So I've come to an expert. What do you think? Well, I think we ought to start at the beginning and then we can get a proper diagnosis. You mean uh, according to the book? It's always the best way. First thing we have to do is go through one of our customer information sheets to mm -hmm. give us a general idea of the problem, such as when does the problem occur? Well, it doesn't seem to happen all the time. In fact, generally it happens when I accelerate away from traffic lights. Okay, yeah, between low and second. Uh, do you hear any noises? Uh, where do they come from? Well, I'm not sure where they're coming from, but sort of a clunky sound. It's the best way I can describe it. Okay. All right, Howdy, I think all this information is fine. We're going to verify it with a road test, but first of all, I want to check the condition and the level of your uh, transmission fluid. Okay. Uh, the engine's got to be at operating temperature, so if you get in, start the engine, open the hood for me. Uh, okay. Get underway as soon as we can, Howdy. Mm-hmm. Okay, Howdy, now what I want you to do is make sure the parking brake is on and a service brake. Now run through all the gears, leave it in each gear for just a couple of seconds, then bring it back to park, all right? Okay. Okay, leave it running for a second. You can shut it off, Howdy. Okay. Now, when we check the level here, we're looking for a hot oil, a hot to the touch, and a clean oil. And any contamination means your transaxle axle has got some problems, may have to be rebuilt. Also, you have to check the level on the dipstick, and this seems to be right up there. Uh, that particular test is passed, and I think we're about ready for a road test, Howdy. Well, Jim, why don't you drive? That's probably a good idea, but I'll let you come along, all right? Okay. Okay, let's get in and go. Yeah, nice car, Howdy. Thanks. Before we leave, I want to show you this uh, road test checklist we go through. That's kind of a guide to make sure we don't miss anything while we're out on the road. Uh, it goes through all the phases, the transaxle has to go through, and then you just mark off whether you pass or fail. Sounds good. The reason I bring you along so as you can point out to me when uh, there is a problem and when it's most prominent. Ready? Great. Ready. All right. Let's get out of here. Okay. Tell me about that first race here. Where was it? Daytona? Daytona, 1971. <laughs> My interest was stemmed from uh, family trips down to Indianapolis back in the, as early as the 60s, early 60s. Uh-huh. Okay. I'll get did you start with a demolition there. derby or anything? No, I started driving when I was 12, really. We lived out in the country. Uh, well, uh, how about some tickets for uh, some upcoming race? No, next year, the, yeah. the Grand Prix. Yeah, I think we can do that, Jim. No problem. And uh, that's how I won my first race. <laughs> that's pretty exciting. That's probably as close as I'll ever get to auto racing, though. Nah. Huh? 
Well, now that we did the road test, we can do some serious diagnosis. Actually, the transmission seems to be in pretty good shape, except for that small upshift problem. And luckily, it's consistent, you know. Intermittent problems are a little harder to discover, but we usually do a pretty good job. We got a lot of help with that, with our diagnosis guide for a slide rule. That gives you a general idea after your road test. A lot of good information in it. Uh, stuff you can find in the service manual, but this is a lot handier to use. Now on the outside you have your range reference chart, which uh, goes through the range of the gears and indicates all the mechanical aspects of the transmission. Now the thing to do here is to determine in which ranges the problem occurs, since your problem occurs during a one to two shift. We'll look at the parts that are involved in first and second gear only. On first gear, the input sprag is holding and the input clutch and one to two band are applied. No other parts are involved. Let's look at second gear. The input sprag overruns now. The input clutch is applied, but not effective. And the one to two band is still applied. Also, the second clutch is applied now. Now we determine which parts had to change function during the one to two shift. The input sprag changed from holding to overrunning, and the second clutch went from inactive to applied. Now mechanically, the problem could either be in the sprag or the second clutch. But keep in mind what the problem is. Mm -hmm. A harsh shift. When the shift does occur, most of the time okay too. Mm -hmm. Now what we've done with the range reference card is narrow the possibilities by eliminating the components that are involved. Okay, let's look at some other parts of the slide rule. It's very important to consider these preliminary checks before going any further in the diagnosis. Now those are about the same as used with any automatic transmission, with a few variations. On the 440T4, fluid level and condition is critical to proper transaxle operation. Too high a level can cause a foaming condition, which can cause as much damage as a too low fluid level. And engine performance should be checked to rule out any related problems there. An engine miss caused by something as simple as a clogged fuel injector can cause shifting problems. Also, the throttle cable should be checked for ease of movement and adjustment. If adjustment is necessary, we always work at the throttle end, not at the accelerator pedal. The vacuum hose to the modulator should be in good shape and there should be no sign of fluid in it. If there's evidence of fluid, replace the modulator. The gear selector indicator should rest in the middle of the selector positions when the lever is in each detent. If it doesn't, the manual linkage should be adjusted so the gear selector seats correctly. A road test is important too. Verification of the customer's complaint is done during the road test. The line pressure check is important to do. It's the best test for evaluating the condition of the transaxle when under load. The slide rule has a separate area which lists the procedures for a 440T4 line pressure test. Now it shows the steps for checking source vacuum and both the minimum and full line pressure tests. Oh yeah, there are gauge hookup location diagrams on the back as well. Pressure specifications can be found in the know-how manual and the service manual. Although all the pressures were within specs, I did notice a slight fluctuation with the needle gauge, especially when I shifted. Well, that's normal, Howdy. The hydraulic fluid pressures change as the oil enters and leaves passages, accumulators, and the servos. Okay? Okay. Let's look at this last part of the slide rule. The circuit system. Here, each main component of the transaxle has been given a code letter. The various concerns are listed in the sliding gauge below the codes. And by lining up the black indicator with the line containing the complaint, like a one to two shift problem, the indicator window shows a list of codes suggesting the possible areas where the problem could be. And notice there are five code letters here, K, L, H, J, and C. K suggests the second clutch, but the shift does occur and with no slippage in second. So for now, we'll eliminate that. L suggests the modulator, but your preliminary checks have shown that the diaphragm is okay and sufficient vacuum is getting to it. H is the oil pump system. 
a faulty pump or pressure regulator valve would have shown up in your pressure test. Now that leaves J and C, or the valve body and the 1-2 accumulator. And considering the problem and the information collected, we've really narrowed it down to those two areas. So that means we go into the hydraulic system. That's where it gets complicated, right? Well, you might think so, Howdy. We've got some additional help that'll narrow the problem down for us even further. Let's take a look here. This easy-to-use diagnosis chart gives us an idea of which specific parts could be causing the problems. Notice the three columns, condition, inspect component, and cause. We can eliminate the first one, oil pressure, since the pressure test was okay on the preliminary check. Now let's look at the second one, accumulator piston and cover. The service procedures we're gonna do can be done right on the car, Howdy, but it might be a little bit easier to see if we use this transaxle I've been working on. First thing we have to do is remove the pan and the filter. This filter acts like a vacuum cleaner. In fact, it does such a good job, it even picks up metal and fiber particles that normally drop into the pan. So we inspect the filter for any signs of damage or clogging as it is removed. Howdy, I usually back flush the filter or sometimes even cut it open to reveal any signs of friction material. Now let's see what the diagnosis chart says about the accumulator. It says, cover bolts improperly torqued, pistons or seals damaged, springs damaged, and gaskets mispositioned or damaged. If the bolts appear to be properly torqued, we want to take a careful look at the gasket, look for tears or improper position. The pistons should pop out easily and show no signs of scoring seal damage, which could cause fluid leakage. Any scoring or gouges in the bores could cause nicking of the seals or sticking pistons. Now these seem to be okay. Now let's look at these springs. Note the different sizes and colors? Yeah. Now each spring is calibrated for this particular transaxle. There are over 40 variations for the 440T4. If a spring must be replaced, the same size and color must be used. And that pretty much takes care of what to look for in the accumulator. What's next on the list? Uh, I think it's the uh, control valve assembly, Jim. And I'm not sure, but uh, I think it's over here on this side. That's right. Uh, could you get me a couple of clean shop towels? I'll start disassembling that. Okay. Working hard, huh, Jim? Yeah. Ah, down to the pump already, huh? Well, the side cover was off, so I decided to work on the pump bolts. Let me have one of those clean rags. And I want to look at this assembly, even though we've determined that this is not the problem with your transaxle. Okay. Well, these small veins sometimes wear into the pump case and cause damage. Or dirt can get in here and cause scoring of the veins. The edges should be shiny. It's always a good idea to check it out for those problems. When in doubt, replace the pump assembly. Next, we're going to remove the valve body. Well, the diagnosis chart says to look for a stuck accumulator valve. We'll also look at some of the other parts involved in the one to two shift. Now, the valve body must be treated gently and gingerly. Okay. Any scratches or gouges on the machine surfaces cause internal leaks. Small scratches can be removed with a fine sharpening stone. Remove the stone in a circular motion, lubricating it with a little Dexron tube. Most of the scratches should come out. Of course, the valve body will have to be thoroughly cleaned afterwards. And we also have some help in inspecting that valve body, Howdy. Right here in the hydraulic update is a color-coded chart. Now, it describes the various things that the transaxle goes through when shifting gears. This color-coded oil flow chart and diagnosis guide are used together. They give an excellent description of where the oil goes and which components are activated in each gear range. Uh, this is the first gear. Notice how at the top of the page is a list of which mechanical parts are active in this range. Now this description tells which hydraulic components are involved, what they do, and where the oil is flowing. Now the best thing to do is to follow the color-coded chart when you read the description. Now the summary, of course, 
is a general description of what is going on inside the case. Let me show you how I use the schematic diagram to trace the oil flow in the circuit. The top of the chart shows a legend of various pressures and how they're displayed on the chart. At the top edge of the chart, there's a cross-sectional diagram of the mechanical assemblies locating them inside the case. Now, for example, in first gear, the input clutch assembly is applied, so we see main line pressure, the solid red line, going to the input clutch assembly. This is the pump assembly. The solid red is main line pressure coming from the pump. Now, that's where it starts. The governor and its circuit are in blue. Here are the shift valves. Note the red main line pressure feeds the center with blue governor pressure on one side and yellow throttle valve pressure on the other. Each shift valve is right next to a smaller valve sensing throttle valve pressure. The little circles show where the springs are that keep tension on the valves. This is the one to accumulator valve. It has main line pressure like the shift valves, but it's activated by modulator pressure, highlighted in brown. The green line is the accumulator pressure. Notice how it goes up to the accumulator pistons. Let's trace the oil through a couple of circuits. Now the easiest way to do this is to read the numbered steps on the description page and then follow the described action on the color-coded schematic diagram. Mm -hmm. For example, in first gear, the 2-3 shift valve feeds main line pressure through the orifices at the 1-2 servo control valve and through check ball number 12 to the 1-2 servo. The servo applies the 1-2 band. Governor pressure increases with vehicle speed. Governor signal pressure pushes against the 1-2, 2-3, and 3-4 throttle valve springs. And when governor pressure is strong enough to overcome spring pressure in a given valve, the valve moves against the spring and the shift happens. Now to see the result of the shift, let's look at the diagram for second gear. See how the valve is shifted? Now the oil can flow over here, around the number eight check ball, through these restrictors, and on up to activate the second clutch. Get the idea? It doesn't seem bad at all if you read the description and follow the diagram step by step. Yeah, almost easy enough for a do-it-yourselfer, Howdy. Well, not that easy. Why don't we take a look at that accumulator valve as mentioned in this chart here. These are close tolerance aluminum bores. You have to be careful not to scratch or nick the valve or the bore as you disassemble it. Now, the valves are steel, but we can't use a magnet for removal. Why? Now, the valves could become magnetized and attract metal particles, causing the valves to stick, <laughs> resulting in shifting problems. Remember the different colored accumulator piston springs, Howdy? Now these little valve springs use the same idea. Now they're color-coded for calibration identification. Gotcha. Look at the varnish deposits. We can remove the deposits with a sharpening stone. The valve should be rolled very lightly on the stone, just enough to remove the deposits and true up the edges. The edges should be sharp enough to shave your thumbnail. Well. Wow. Well, the sharp edges help push dirt and metal particles out of the bores. Now, of course, I'll clean the valve and bore completely before reassembly. Well, this spacer plate has some numbers on it. These identify the plate as calibrated for a particular application. These holes are the restrictors we saw in the schematic diagram. Now, obviously, the size and location of the restrictors vary from car to car. Mm. Speaking of restrictions, how about those two check balls, uh, number 12 and number 8? They're in the valve body, aren't they? No, there are check balls in the valve body, but the ones we're dealing with are in the channel plate here. The number 8 check ball is right here, and the number 12 check ball is right here. They should be inspected for scratches, gouges, or anything that looks like it would cause them to stick in the passage. Now, how do you, there are diagrams in the service manual that point out the location of each check ball in the valve body yeah, but, and the channel plate assemblies. Yeah, but how do you keep all those check balls from falling out if you're doing all this on the car? Yeah, if you tilt this a little bit, they will come out. But 
Well, this red assembly lubricant works real well, and it's compatible with automatic transmission fluid. I just use enough to hold everything in place during movement or reassembly. Now, white petroleum jelly is okay, too, but we can't use chassis or wheel bearing grease. Now, the melting point of both is too high, and it can clog up the bores. I suppose torquing these machine components is critical. Sure is. And we use a three-step procedure gradually working up to the final torque. And we start at the center of the assembly and work our way out. And it's kind of like smoothing out a crumpled piece of paper. And the know-how manual contains the tightening specifications for all the assemblies and bolts. Jim, if the repair to the transaxle is pretty ex extensive, mm -hmm. uh, are there any alternatives to uh, what might be a, an expensive overhaul? Well, our main alternative is what we call a CERTA unit. Come here. A CERTA, S-R-T-A, means Service Replacement Transmission Assembly. It's a completely remanufactured unit ready to install on a vehicle. But a CERTA replacement is only used when the cost of repairing the original unit is higher than the cost of a replacement. Well, of course, whether it's a replacement or an overhaul, the torque converter and the transaxle oil cooler should be flushed to remove all contaminants. This has been great. I guess it isn't quite so complicated when you look at it piece by piece. No, nah, how do you really isn't if you're a professional like me, like you, you know. Yeah, you know, you're the type of guy we'd like on our pit crew. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I gotta work weekends, right? That's true. No weekends for me. Okay. But uh, how about those tickets for the Grand Prix? Well, there you have it. With Jim's help, I feel I've learned a great deal more about the 440T4. And if you didn't before, I'm sure you do now. It's your fate to consult an expert, doesn't it?